thank you very much for the opportunity to present. Um, conscious of time, so I'll give the short form version of this presentation. Um, rather than sort of getting too deep into the laws, um, presenting two lawyers, uh, and, and in any event my colleagues are doing that with UAE and China, I thought I'd just give a bit of an insight into uh, arbitration from a contractor's perspective. Um, as I was introduced, I was in private practice until late last year. Um, so I've had about four months of experience in, in our in-house, which has been an uh, interesting sort of insight into the sorts of considerations that actually do go into um, deciding uh, which dispute uh, resolution mechanism to use. And once you do get into a dispute, the sort of considerations that happen internally. Um, and I was, I was quite surprised by um, just the, the, the number of layers there are in order to get a decision impro uh, like approved. Um, as a private practice lawyer, I always sort of thought we'd give advice and then the next day they would implement that. Um, and when it took time, I always wondered why were they taking so much time? You know, I've worked really hard. I was here until midnight the night before doing this. But, um, uh, you know, it, it does take time, these things. Um, and arbitration uh, is new to a lot of people still. Um, it's, it's becoming more and more popular, but um, uh, particularly some of the commercial teams and the management teams uh, in large organisations, they're not always familiar with these things. Um, so it's important to kind of clearly communicate with your external legal providers and, um, and develop a strategy early on and stick to it. Um, so the, the three things I'll touch on, I'll, I'll focus mainly on the first one, given the time. Uh, why we use arbitration, um, the keys or my, my experience to having a positive arbitration experience and, uh, and a few take home points. So uh, my organisation, Petrofac, is an international oil and gas uh, company um, and, and like sort of a lot of large international contractors, we, we put forward sort of many, many bids a year. Um, we can cover bids in countries up to sort of sometimes 30 different countries a year. Um, practically speaking, it's absolutely impossible for us to have a uh, complete understanding of the laws of all of those countries that we're putting bids in for. So if we were resigned to having to resolve future disputes in the court systems, uh, we would be paying uh, endless amounts to the local lawyers to resolve those things. Um, and, and, and that assumes as though we even get in, on top of what those laws are. Um, but arbitration does present a bit of a solution. Um, you can get familiar uh, with different procedures by um, having some consistency in your contracts. Um, so if you, if you use LCIA arbitration in London, you're going you're gonna to have a pretty good idea of how the procedure is going to run, even if the next time you have a dispute it's a different arbitral tribunal. Um, so the flexibility of arbitration is, um, is, is critical. Um, it, it helps international businesses flourish. Um, the second one, expertise of decision makers, uh, is another really important consideration. Uh, most of the big projects that go to arbitration, you'll have three arbitrators. Often one is selected by each of the parties and then the third one is, a, is the chairman selected by the two party appointed arbitrators. If you have a, an intricate um, dispute regarding the building of a pipeline or a refinery in Iraq or a gas um, processing plant in Australia, wherever the case might be, um, you don't want to be spending endless amounts of time trying to educate that decision maker um, what, about what the dispute involves. Um, you, you, you ideally want them to have a pretty good starting point um, so uh, if, if, for example, there's a gas processing plant in Australia, um, you, you know, we would ordinarily look to appoint an arbitrator that's got some Australian experience and ideally some, you know, some engineering experience, um, particularly with gas processing plants. Um, you don't always get that luxury. If it, if it goes to, through a different dispute rec resolution mechanism like a court, um, often you're, kind of, you're stuck with who's appointed to you. Um, and, with all respect to the judges, and they do a marvellous job, but um, sometimes an arbitrator uh, will be um, more suitable for that particular dispute. Um, enforceability has been touched on, um, but uh, it would be negligent of me not to kind of put my two cents in. Um, internally, when we have a proposal and we've got a, a contract, uh, and, it, and it turns to the sort of commercial considerations in the contract, one of the first questions that comes up is, um, you know, is that counterparty a mem uh, from a country that's a member of the United Nations Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Awards, so the New York Convention 1958. Um, if they're not, we, you know, it's a pretty big red flag because you, you start asking questions down the track, well, if we have a dispute and we get an award, um, how are we ever going to see the money? Um, so um, enforceability of arbitration, that New York Convention is, is um, unparalleled. Uh, 
to, to enforce a, a court judgment, you often need some form of bilateral treaty or other international convention. Um, whereas arbitration is sort of on the latest count, I think it's up to 190 or so um, member states. So it, it does cover the majority of the world um, and, uh, and it gives you a little bit of peace of mind that, that you might actually um, be able to enforce the end, the end award. Um, neutrality is important, of course. Uh, I mean, everyone would be aware that you know, if, if you have a, a project in Algeria, um, the counterparty is Algerian, we're a UAE entity, um, there's nothing to stop us from having our arbitration in London or in Singapore, or something like that. So it, it's particularly important when the counterparty um, is from another country, and, and, and in particular if they've got some links to the government of that country, um, arbitration does provide a mechanism to kind of step away from that side of things, remove potential bias and, and have your dispute heard elsewhere in a neutral state. So it's good for all parties. Um, and I touched on familiarity before. Um, yeah, it's that notion that uh, the, more, the more often you're involved in a dispute process, uh, the more familiar you become with it, the more feasible it is to enter into new jurisdictions um, without having to fully equip yourself with the, the laws of that jurisdiction. Um, I've put it deliberately on the other side, um, and I've started the list again from number one, some other potential benefits. Um, I often hear arbitration talked about um, as people entering into it because it's more efficient and it's, uh, and it's less costs. Uh, from my experience, that's not always the case. Um, it really does depend on, on, a, on a few factors. One is uh, the actual arbitration agreement you have in the first place, making sure it's comprehensive enough and you're not going to get bogged down with the procedural issues down the track. Uh, secondly, the conduct of the parties. Um, so I heard one of the presenters in the earlier session um, on third party funding talking about uh, one party not paying fees um, and the other party having to do it and then it gets costly for them and they end up having to settle it. Um, it's not just not paying fees. You, the parties deliberately take actions to stall arbitrations just like they do with court processes. Um, so your terms of reference from the start or your procedural timetable uh, really does need to be strictly adhered to in order to realise that potential benefit of efficiency. Um, and that brings me to the, the, the sort of the third factor that's important in terms of cost and efficiency, and that's the, the, the choice of the arbitrators themselves. Um, arbitrators often got, get bogged down in this notion of uh, procedural fairness and making sure that each party has the rights to be heard because it, it's an express clause in most of the, the sets of rules. But at the end of the day, it's actually, whilst they're trying to be perceived as being fair to one party, they're actually being unfair to the other party that's, uh, that's having to incur all these costs, it's having to stall, it's affecting its operations. Um, so I, I put them on the side. They are potential benefits, but they're not always benefits. Um, confidentiality and privacy is, um, uh, you know, if, if an arbitration is behind closed doors, in theory, uh, you know, it's good for the business, but in, inevitably it tends to sort of get out down the track at some point. So I'm a, I've got a bit of doubts as to just how much of a benefit that is. Um, Consolidation is important from our perspective. Uh, so as a contractor, we're the middleman, essentially. We've, we've got disputes up the chain with the client. We have disputes down the chain with the subcontractor. Um, so we try as best as possible to align our dispute clauses in those separate contracts um, to, to hopefully one day facilitate um, an increased possibility of consolidating and joining, um, which can uh, create some efficiencies and costs in that sense. Um, and just generally convenience. Um, it's, uh, that, that goes hand in hand with the fam familiarity and some of the other benefits on the left hand side. So from my experience, some of the, the keys to a, having a positive arbitration experience, um, I'll talk more about the effective arbitration agreement on the next slide, but um, just, just actually taking the time to, to draft a proper clause. Um, it sounds obvious, but it, you know, this term midnight clause is often thrown in. Um, parties get the contract sorted and then right at the end they copy and paste the dispute clause from a previous contract and put it into this one. Um, secondly, and probably relevantly for, for a lot of you in the audience, is having effective support from your external law firms and, and, and legal providers. Um, I, I guess that, that I touched on it briefly earlier. Uh, it, it's been, been eye-opening for me just seeing how an internal organisation actually runs um, and, and how important it is to get timely uh, deliverables, um, to get the deliverables you actually want. Um, so if all you really want is an answer um, tomorrow, but you get a 10-page written advice in four days' time, um, whilst it's over-delivering, and in theory that's good, 
we, we might have already had to make a decision internally and that, that advice is, becomes redundant. So, um, in an arbitration sense, uh, with the procedural timetable, uh, the, the, the arbitral tribunal is expecting certain answers by a particular time. And uh, what, what's important to understand for the external lawyers is that if we have to deliver something to a tribunal on the 15th of January, we need the legal advice by the 10th of January in order to go through our internal channels to, to take it through risk review meetings, to get management approval on certain things, and then to implement that strategy and prepare the response by the 15th of Jan. Um, and then the third one uh, is the carefully selected tribunal. Um, so it's, it's those two notions. Under, it's a tribunal that actually understands the subject matter of the dispute um, and, and, and the ability to uphold the procedural timetable. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it at this slide once I've finished this. I'll, I'll wrap up and um, we can move on because I know you're probably all getting hungry. But uh, on the left-hand side are some of the essential provisions that you, you, you really got to have in your arbitration agreement. Um, what, what's important to, to note for those that aren't overly familiar with arbitration, in, an, in a simple term, everyone has their right to be heard in court. They, they, human beings and um, in, in their individual capacity or, or companies, Whenever you've got a dispute, you, your default position is that you have your right to your day in court. So by choosing arbitration, you are waiving that right. You, you, are, you are deciding to waive your right to go to court and instead have your, your dispute heard critically important. Um, I won't go into too much detail about the legalities of it, but the place of arbitration is where the actual arbitration takes, takes place, where it's heard. It differs from the seat of arbitration. Um, which is on the right. The seat of arbitration is your legal place of arbitration. They can be different, um, and, and it gets that back to that flexibility of arbitration. You can make it different. You can have your arbitration heard in Dubai, but your legal seat uh, be Singapore. Um, so f in terms of enforcement, it would need to comply with Singapore's requirements, uh, but that's getting quite technical. Uh, the governing law is, is more of your, the law that's actually going to apply to the substance of your dispute. It can either feature in the arbitration agreement itself or elsewhere in the contract. Uh, the rules of arbitration are your procedural mechanism. Um, so that's your LCIA rules or your ICC rules or, or the DIAC rules. Um, and probably most importantly and most surprisingly is how often you, you see in contracts an arbitration clause that's then subsequently followed by the right for a party to go to court. Um, and often it actually says things like um, any disputes uh, will be resolved by arbitration in accordance with X and Y rules. Um, and then the next clause will say the parties consent to um, the exclusive jurisdiction of the courts of London. Now, the two are, the two are completely contradictory. Um, so ensuring that your actual arbitration agreement is, is the mechanism by which you will resolve disputes to the exclusion of courts is important because otherwise you can get bogged down in very long um, procedural and jurisdictional uh, issues between the parties. Um, in that sense, the courts do have a role. They, they are supporting of arbitration. So if you need to help, need help with appointing the tribunal, or, or the, but they're not, uh, they're not a conflicting jurisdiction. It's one or the other. Um, so just uh, in, you know, in terms of just a, a few take home points, um, spend the time to draft an effective arbitration agreement. Um, and if you don't get that right, and you do go into a dispute, spend the time trying to negotiate with the other party to get appropriate terms of reference um, so that any loose ends that weren't dealt with in the arbitration agreement you agree to before the dispute gets too heated because once you're involved in the actual arbitration itself and, and there are any loose ends then one of the parties invariably is going to try and utilise that to their advantage, stall the arbitration and result in more cost. Um, communication is key um, with your external law firms, the other side, um, any legal support you have, any experts you have, quantum, delay, um, just getting everyone on the right page and developing that strategy because otherwise it gets out of hand, issues start, um, scope, you know, tangent issues arise. And, that. Um, and then finally, uh, like I've mentioned, the, the suitably qualified uh, tribunal and um, one that's procedurally orientated so that they stick to the timeframes. Thanks very much.